Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to my channel. This is The Way to Be. Today is Friday, November 15th, and this is Frequently Asked Questions for Beginning Beekeepers, episode 39. So in this uh, episode, we're answering your questions that were posted during the past week. And if you're new here, welcome. And uh, look down in the video description to see what we're gonna talk about today and see if it's of any interest at all to you. If you have questions of your own, please feel free to write them down in the comment section below the video. And uh, I'll take notes, and if uh, some of the questions seem like they'd be of broad appeal next Friday, we'll add them to the list, and I'll even write that next to your question that will be on FAQ 40 next Friday. So let's jump right into it. Frozen, by the way, as you can see by the intro. Jenny Stein wrote, you've covered infrared cameras. Could you please describe why you like the model you're using? First of all, why do we even need infrared cameras? That's a good question, Jenny. Thank you for sending it in. And uh, I like to look at the bees. And it doesn't matter if it's summer or winter. I use it to look to see how cool or hot the hives are in the middle of summer. If my hive visors are providing enough shade and if that's cooling the landing board, for example. And in the winter time, I like to see where the cluster is. And we do that by reading the surface temperature of the beehive. Now, this is also great for finding mouse nests and things like that that might be in your barn or in your chicken coop. And you can find out where things are hiding based on the thermal print they leave behind. And uh, this is called the FLIR C2. I've had this for many years. Why did I choose this model? Uh, because this does not require anything else. You can use the FLIR unit and... Um, it's a standalone deal. There are applications, of course. There's another lens made by the same company that will go right on your cell phone, a little cheaper. If you don't have a cell phone, if you're like me and you don't like to be trailed around electronically, then uh, a Flare C2 is gonna do very well. And this one's booting up right now. This is what it looks like. You have two lenses on the front of it. One lens records a normal image and the second lens records a thermal image. So it creates this overlay, which gives the illusion that it's very detailed. So you're seeing me and you're looking at the surface temperature of my face. So it also gives the full range of temperature. Off to the right side of the screen, it shows the highest temperature in the scope of the field of view and also the lowest temperature. So you can see what the differences are Super handy. There's a USB plug-in. It has its own built-in batteries that are permanent. It, uh, I've carried this around in the worst possible weather and it works very well. It's the temperature of my coffee cup right here. So anyway, the FLIR C2, that's what I use. It even has a built-in flash, which I've never used. It's a very low resolution, regular camera as far as that goes. And uh, it's just a wonderful tool. So you can also, people use this as electricians, for example, to see where the wires are overheating, where there might be a short and things like that. But for us, it shows where the bees are, how hot the bees are, what your colony is doing. So FLIR C2. Good question. That's why I chose it. It does not require a phone. Uh, charge is easy. You can download photos. They're very low resolution, as I said, for information only. And you can find out where temperature changes occur. You can also use it to see how well your house is insulated or well or where the leaks are. You can, uh, if you have an insulated beehive and you can't shoot the surface of it, you can look at the landing board and see where the air is going in and out and see what that temperature is and you'll know your bees are alive that way. You won't necessarily know exactly where that cluster is located, but uh, it's, a, it's a cool tool. You can do a lot of different things with it. Number two, Al Arkin 99. I really do not want, nor do I have the time, for more than two hives. And then uh, Al went on to write a lengthy description about how he just wants two hives in his yard, he doesn't want a million beehives, and so on. And he wants to know if it's bad or impossible to keep just a couple small hives without expanding and adding hives until your apiary is overgrown. Well, um, there are a lot of people probably that don't want to have a lot of beehives. So what happens if you're just keeping one or two hives and when the populations build up in those hives, you have two choices. You can draw off the resources that they've saved during the year, and we're talking about 
honey surplus, which is in the supers, which are storage for extra honey in your beehive. If you don't keep up with that and expand the space, then your bees are going to eventually fill the spaces that they need for reproduction, and it can trigger them to swarm out. Now, is swarming out a terrible thing? Well, some people live in residential neighborhoods and they're concerned that swarms will fly out and then people will uh, be concerned when they see a swarm of bees on their tree or their bush or the side of their house or something. And uh, so there's the good neighbor concern. The other thing is people just don't want to manage a whole pile of bee colonies. I get the question myself. Fred, if you really know what you're doing, why don't you have 300 beehives? Don't want them. I just want to study the bees and I obviously I don't have the time. Uh, I have time for a handful of hives and I can monitor them very closely. What happens, for example, when bees occupy a tree? Or if they occupy a limited space, they will fill the space through reproduction, their numbers will grow until they've outgrown the space and then they're going to generate new queen cells and then there's going to be a swarm and the old queen's going to leave and their numbers are going to be drawn down by 50 to 70 percent of the workers in that colony. This happens, for example, in my observation beehive. I talk about it a lot. That is a swarm generator. What are they doing right now? They're fantastic. They're healthy. They're going, you know, we're in winter now. So through the year, what they do is they build up and emit a swarm, build up and emit a swarm. And they do that several times and then they continue to occupy the same space. If you're involved in honey production and you're trying to profit from your bees, you're going to want to expand your colonies with more supers and let their numbers build and then you get a bigger workforce and then you have more foraging bees and you have a higher honey production, for example, and you have more bees to work the brood, therefore larger brood, and it can actually grow faster than a smaller colony. I call that a super colony. I have one of those that I let grow and I keep stacking the boxes on it just because I use that for splits. So when those build up and they start building the queen cells, they give you an early warning that they're thinking about swarming. So another thing that Al can do is invite another friend over who wants the bees. So when they start to reach maximum capacity, have someone else bring a bee box over with some frames in it and they can actually pull brood frames and we can do a split and you can help other people get bees and keep your own bee numbers low. So you really want, depending on the environment that you're in, the region that you're in, Al doesn't say where he lives, but if you're in a cold climate, you want to always be planning ahead for the winter. So you need to make sure that you have resources on so that your bees can use the extra frames to provide their winter stores. And there's a lot of discussion right now about what can I feed my bees now they're in winter? What can I put on there? What kind of sugar? What kind of fondant? Well, if you've left on enough honey for your bees, those questions, those are just emergency backup plans. So hopefully, even with a single deep box and then a medium super, your bees are going to be able to have the resources that they need to get them through winter without supplemental feeding. If you're a backyard beekeeper and you're not into commercial beekeeping and you're not trying to get maximum productivity, there's nothing wrong with allowing your colony to remain small. And you can do that by limiting the size of their resources. And this is one of the things that gets talked about a lot when we look at feral colonies in the woods. Some of them, when they finally do cut open a tree and it's got a hollowed out section, how large is it? Well, Dr. Seeley from um, Cornell University, who believes in natural beekeeping, uh, has noted that predominantly those cavities are about the size of a 10 frame Langstroth deep box and just, just slightly larger and in some cases slightly smaller. And then the question is why do these untreated, uncared for feral colonies of honeybees make it out in the woods so long? Well, for one, we don't observe them all the time. So you don't know how many times they swarmed out. Every time a colony swarms and breaks the brood cycle, they also impact the Varroa destructor mite. Because by breaking the brood cycle, you take away its area where it's going to reproduce as well. So this is a type of natural mite control that doesn't exist in colonies where you keep your hives and you keep your bees and you keep your queen and you keep expanding to hang on to everybody that you have. The goal for most is not to have a swarm to expand, to get lots of honey, and to keep the bee populations high. 
that has its merit and that's high productivity and then that gives you more resources to take off plus a lot of extra bees. But if you leave it at the normal size, the size cavity that they would occupy on their own, then they naturally swarm and reproduce, replace the queen, build up fresh stock, reach their maximum numbers again, swarm out again, and then hopefully by winter time. That means every winter those feral colonies are going in with a young queen, a queen that's less than a year old, who can probably handle winter very well because that's the area that they naturally reproduced in. So there's, you know, don't feel pressure to expand and make super colonies or to expand the numbers of your colonies as a way of demonstrating that somehow this means you have greater knowledge or ability with the bees. Uh, there are a lot of people that have nice garden plots in suburbia that do not want or have the space for a bunch of beehives. So one or two beehives, I always recommend though, that people have at least two so that you'll be able to compare the two and see, is this doing well? Is this one not doing so well? If you only have one colony, then you only have one standard to go by when you're looking to see whether or not they're doing well or if they're in decline or if they need some kind of attention from the beekeeper. So that's my advice on that. You can stay small. And if anybody has paid attention to what I do, I, I don't freak out when my bees swarm. Most of my colonies swarmed this year and I still had great production. And now this winter we've got very healthy bees going in. So we're gonna see how that goes. I, keep, I try to keep my apiary at 10 hives, but I'm evaluating more equipment and I realize that more hives means more opportunity for testing and a greater consensus when you're trying to find out what works and what doesn't. And uh, I only have 15 hives. So even some people would say that's too small to really get a reasonable uh, feel for what's really working for your bees other than the ultimate test being what happens in spring and how many of your colonies made it through and then everyone goes to breakfast and sits around and speculates as to why someone's bees made it and someone else's bees didn't and in some cases there's no rhyme or reason because last year for example one of my smallest colonies was in a single deep eight frame uh, flow hive two by itself and they came through winter. Meanwhile, a very large, robust colony did not make it through winter. So this is part of the frustration of keeping bees, deciding how many to keep, what to keep them in, and how much care you're going to apply to get them through your winter conditions or summer dearth, for example. So there's so much discussion about how things should be configured. But if you don't want a lot, keep it small. That's a good question there. Next one, do you plan to review the new flow hive with their wood sourcing? Uh, I forgot the name of the person that asked this question and I wrote, of course I am, I have one, I'm putting it together. Um, there is new material that they're using right now if you're looking at flow hives. They make them out of cedar and they make them out of aricaria wood and now the new one is pronounced polonia wood but it's spelled p-a-u-l-o-w-n-i-a and they've put it out in a six frame um, flow hive 2 configuration and it is on their website and you can't order it until december so right now it's in the pre-order status so what the heck is Polonia. Well, this is their new Flow Hive 2 material. This is the ridge that goes on the roofing. This is what the grain looks like. And I have to tell you something about this wood. It is so lightweight, it feels almost like balsa wood or bass wood, you know, that's very easy to carve and everything. But look, it has this heavy grain. Balsa and bass wood does not have this heavy grain. This wood is so light. And I notice, and yes, I, I have this, and of course I have to tell you about this one. I asked them about this wood and the new hive that they're putting together, this new Flow Hive 2 made out of this Paloma wood, Polonia, and they sent it to me. So the rest of you have to wait until December. I have mine right now, and of course I have to review it, talk about it. 
And this is one of the roof panels for the Flow Hive 2. And if you've ever put one of these together before, this comes in two pieces. But in this one, they went ahead and put it together for you. I guess they might be getting tired of people not being able to fit these up. But what I want to show you again is this wood grain. That is the polonia wood and is so lightweight. Now what makes it light? It's super porous and one of the advantages of porous material is it's going to trap air, that it will be um, more insulating, but it's also extremely soft. Let me tell you something. You can take your fingernail and dent this wood. So soft. You are going to have to uh, put a really good finish on it. I also noticed that they made their screw holes, their pre-drilled screw holes are much larger, so they might have concerns that people would be splitting it up. This is the base material that is the support base for the Flow Hive 2, which also has legs that allow you to adjust it. But so this uh, Polonia hardwood, which by the way, I did some checking on this material. One of the reasons that they're using it is because it's such a sustainable resource. I guess this wood grows really fast. They reach harvest size, great big trunks at six to eight years. So it's a very fast renewable source of wood. And I think they're using it a lot in laminates. So they're making plywood out of it. In this case, it's going to be made into beehives. And uh, just give you an example of the weight comparison. Uh, per board foot, maple on average weighs four pounds per board foot. This polonia weighs 1.39 pounds per board foot. So if you've ever picked up a piece of you know, balsa wood and stuff, and it just feels so light and full of air. That's kind of what this feels like. It's also really popular with karate kids when they come to, they want to chop boards and kick them and break them and things like that. This is a uh, type of wood that frequently gets used for that because it can look like you're really, really strong and lethal. So I haven't got it together yet. I'm going to put it together. Will I make a video of it once it's put together? Yes, it's going to look exactly like the other Flow Hive 2s. Uh, the difference will be the material it's made out of. And we're going to find out what the R factor difference is. How much insulating value will that add to a hive of the same thickness and the same, you know, dimensional material? Is it going to be a big game changer? Well, I know for sure it's going to be thirsty wood. And like I said, it's pre-ordered right now. They'll start shipping them in December. That tree grows six meters per year. And some of the leaves on it are up to three feet in diameter. And it grows, people are growing it all over the world. It's grown in the Southern United States. It's being grown and harvested in Germany. So it is recognized as something, uh, it grows 60 to 80 feet tall in five years. So there's a downside to that. One is that people don't want those trees that grow that fast, that take up that kind of space in that short a time. Uh, it could be considered an invasive tree. So, and the, and the branches will break easily in storms and things like that. So there are some drawbacks to it, but it's also a great renewable. So it'll be treated like uh, an agricultural product. So they'll grow it for harvest. And in this case, I guess uh, the Flow Hive group has decided to make some of their hives out of it. So we'll see how that goes. Should be interesting. Super soft, super lightweight. And thank you for that question. I'm sorry, I did not remember who asked it. Al Arkin, again, Al Arkin 99, what can I do with extracted honey with a higher than desired moisture content? Uh, so, this happens sometimes when you get to the end of the year, if you're doing an emergency pull-off. Um, really, if there's a higher moisture content and you get a chance to assess that while it's on the hive, don't pull it off. Some people, um, I know it, it's hard to say that, they pull all their frames out and they, they set them on a bench somewhere and then by the time they get into it, they realize that uh, the honey moisture content is too high. So the first question is, how did you determine what your moisture content is? So the next thing is people wanna know what refractometer they should use. Every beekeeper, even a backyard beekeeper, should have a refractometer. They run a full span of uh, how expensive they are. You'll see a lot of them on Amazon. Amazon's probably a good source because you can read reviews and see who liked them and didn't. 
you can see what the accuracy is. And of course, I'm going to talk to you about a professional level refractometer. And this is foolproof. Uh, one of the most frequent questions people are asking about the refractometers, no matter which ones they get, how do I calibrate it? How accurate is the calibration? What temperature does a room have to be in when I calibrate it? What temperature does the honey have to be when I test it? And on and on it goes. This is made by MISCO. This one is just for honey testing. It is extremely accurate and it is what uh, the food inspectors use. And I'm going to give you the uh, exact model number because the company makes lots of these things for a variety of applications. This is called the Palm Abbey Digital Refractometer and it is number PA201X. So Digital Refractometer number PA201X and it's made by the MISCO company and it's made here in the United States in Cleveland. It's patented. But one of the advantages of this is you can have this in your pocket. You can go right out to your bee yard. You can take a little pipette or anything else. And when you've got a honey frame and you've got uncapped honey, because this is where all the discussion comes in. Well, that frame is 50% capped. I can pull it. I know that's good to go. Do you really? Uh, you may even have a completely uncapped frame that is actually reduced down enough that you could still harvest that. And you would know that if you stood right out there with a refractometer and you did a reading right there. And you just put the little drip on the lens here. And then this little stainless steel disc that's on the front, when you close this up, it uh, actually warms it to the ambient temperature that's perfect for testing and it gives you a direct readout of the percent of water in the honey. Anything under 20% is probably going to make it. Anything under 18% is going to remain in a bacterial and it's going to be good for a very long time. So if you get 18% or less while you're out there in your bee yard, and even though it's not finished being capped, you know that you can draw off that honey and it's going to be stable for as long as you're going to live. So this is the one I recommend. There are a lot of inexpensive ones, but their tolerances are really wide. You can be off by two or 3% with some of them. And so if you're hovering around 18%, that two or 3% margin of error goes up, then you could actually have honey that eventually could spoil or might not have the properties that you want. So, um, do, do, do. let's say that you're now, you're inside and you do have this honey and it is too high of a moisture content. And let's say it's, you know, 21, 22% water. Can you do anything with it now? What's going to happen if I don't do anything with it? Well, it's going to ferment. It's going to start to turn into some kind of wonky mead. It's going to spoil and it's going to smell zingy. So what you can do, you take it into your, if you've got a home dehumidifier, if you don't have one, you might want to get one. And you take it in the smallest room of your house. It might be a utility room. It might be a bathroom that you don't need. Maybe a guest bathroom. You set all your jars, say, in the bathtub with all the lids off. So you take these jars, you set them in there, you take off these lids, and you put them all in a basin or in a deep sink or something like that. And then you take a fan, a regular household fan, and you aim it straight at the lids at the tops of all of your honey. And then you turn on your dehumidifier and you turn it on max dehumidifying whatever your settings are for yours. Because the dehumidifier, it also heats the room as it draws the moisture out and condensation goes into the dehumidifier's reservoir. And then what happened was, because we tested that this year, and I probably should share what dehumidifier model we use. So I'll put that down in the video description if you want to check it out. And uh, we drew down 1.75% every 14 hours. So you reasonably leaving it in the jars, of course, if you poured it out in a larger pan, you're adding a lot of steps and a potential mess, but the more surface area, the faster you can dehumidify the honey. So, but we just left the lids off. And then you might think, well, if just the lid is off, and the dehumidifying is just at the surface here. And aren't you just condensing it up here? Or what about at the bottom? Would it still be high water down at the bottom? No, it's really weird. The water is shared equally through the honey. So if you're dehumidifying it on the surface, you're dehumidifying the entire jar. Take for consideration, 
looking at a frame of honeycomb. The bees, when they're dehumidifying the honey, are only doing the surface. Once they've filled the cell, they're dehumidifying based on the surface area. And then as it gets really tight to those tolerances, they start capping it up and the bees will still be sticking their tongue through a tiny opening in the cap and putting those last little bits of honey in there. And there's also a lot of uh, dehydration that goes on just as they're passing the honey across their tongues when they're putting it in things. So yeah, it dehumidifies the entire jar. And uh, you'll find out what the rate is because every day, just go in there and test the, the percentage of water in each jar until it gets down. I recommend get it down to 18% or lower. Below 20% is probably gonna make it 18%, you're solid. So you can dehumidify it. Smaller space, more effective because remember you're dehumidifying the entire room. Uh, the dehumidifier will heat the room, which aids also in dehumidification. So that's pretty good. And that's a good question. And then he has a second part to this question. Is it necessary to remove supers in an area where the winter isn't bad like Florida? And I think uh, Al is talking about the flow hive supers. In other words, I take mine off for winter. But in other zones where you don't have a heavy winter, where you don't have to worry about your bees moving up into it and uh, abandoning your queen, that's the big deal. When you have honey supers on and you go into winter, if those honey supers are not for the bees, if you've got a queen excluder under that, then you do have to take it off for winter. And that's because the cluster of the bees in your deep box are going to want to migrate up across the food, consuming as they go, and they're gonna to wanna to end up in the top. And if they're starving, they're going to abandon the queen and she'll be stuck below your queen excluder and then the rest of the colony will move above that and then the queen will have a few faithful workers around her that will just expire with her. So whatever you're leaving on for winter, when it gets really cold, if you're in an area like that, uh, you wanna make sure that your bees have resources and that they can all move together up into the super. Otherwise, yes, take it off. Anything that you're leaving on through winter or through severe dearth periods, because they do the same thing in a period of dearth, they also move up into the resources that they have. So queen excluders need to be considered and you need to make sure that the entire cluster has access to resources to get them through. So if it's a flow hive, uh, and you're gonna have, if it's a, you know, maybe it's a six, eight, 10 week period where it's gonna be fairly cold and the bees are gonna consume their resources, you wanna make sure that you do pull the flow super off uh, because otherwise the workers will migrate up in there and potentially abandon the queen. So that's my thought on that. Thinless. You show hives level side to side. Should they be level front to back? And uh, that's a good question. And I made a mock-up just for that question today. When you're setting up your beehives, and I've seen bee yards before where all the hives are tilted every which way and they look kind of drunk. And I think what happens is the ground settles and heaves and everything else through the year. So what are the critical leveling requirements when you're setting up your beehive in your backyard? Well, you want to make sure that your beehive is absolutely level side to side. So this is your front of your beehive, the back, or vice versa. The bees, when they're drawing out comb, this is a wooden frame, and this would be considered foundationless. And the reason I have a string here is because bees do their work in the dark. And with the bees, there is a wooden starter strip here, which isn't even required. They'll naturally start to build their comb off of the bottom side of the top bar of this frame. And this is a standard Langstroth deep frame. What they'll do is they'll hold onto each other's feet and they'll size it up. And sometimes as they start to draw out their honeycomb, you'll see them make a little teardrop shaped one sometimes. And as they spread out, they'll add to that. And that's why the center, when you pull comb that's in progress, it almost always has this shape. And that's because it's been built with gravity. So now, if we tip it front to back, let's do this. Tip it front to back, it stays within the frame, see? So if it's a flow hive and I've got it tilted back because I'm gonna draw honey off of it later, I'm not disrupting all the wax building that they're doing down in the bottom. However, 
if I tip my hive left to right, what happens to the, the wax comb that they're going to build? And, and that's not a huge tilt. I've seen whole beehives tilted worse than this. And they'll draw their comb outside of the frame and it will not meet the bottom and it will not have that structural support. And then what happens to the frame adjacent to that? Their comb comes over here too. And then they can do bridging comb and they'll start connecting these frames together in a wonky way that when you take apart your brood box or your supers, you're going to have a real mess because all this comb is going to be connected in a way that's going to require you to cut it apart. And then you're going to leak honey all over it, kick off robbing, have a huge mess, have your bees not like you. So the very best thing you can do is keep them absolutely level side to side. And you can tip winter time, for example, let's say this is the front, we want our hive tipped forward so that when the snow and everything piles up on here and as it melts, it goes away and doesn't go into your hive across the bottom board. If you've got solid bottom boards, if it were slightly tilted back, then rainwater and everything else runs in and now the bees have to deal with it. So that's why we keep it level. But somebody might say, what about the single piece frames that already have the foundation drawn? This is a Pierco frame. It's flexed a little bit this way and it's concave a little bit this way. So if you set this up, because now they're not drawing it with gravity, right? So if you used a frame with a foundation already in it, even if it's wax instead of plastic, wouldn't the bees just then, even if it was tipped, they're still gonna follow this, right? Often they don't. In fact, with some of these frames, especially these one piece plastic frames, if they're not perfectly vertical, the bees will attach a secondary comb strip here on the edge, and then you'll see it come out straight down and they'll not even use this surface. And I'm sure anyone who's kept bees for any amount of time and has used these types of frames has actually seen that happen. And, uh, if this is not adequately waxed and the bees don't like it and they don't want to build onto this foundation, they'll leave an air space here and they'll build their comb off of it anyway. Now you've really got a mess. So keep it level and have plenty of heavy waxing done to prime it. So yes, even with the foundation frames, you still have to keep them level side to side, front to back, not so critical. So I hope that explained my logic behind that one. That's a good question though. But I do like the flow highs. I leave them tilted back in the summer and then I tilt them forward in the winter. But also your landing board should be camfered at an angle so that even with your, when you're tilted back, uh, the rain would shed off the front. But for winter, I tilt them all towards the landing boards. Next, what are the flow frames dimensions? And this comes from Robert. Um, G-O-E-C-K-E-L, Geckel, maybe. Uh, the flow frame dimensions are very specific. So here's what I'm going to do. For those of you who want to know exactly what they are, and the reason he's asking is because he's going to build his own boxes and he's just going to buy the flow frames and put them in them and going to accommodate that. I will put uh, the printouts, the pictures of the very specific dimensions of each flow frame, both the UK nationals and the Langstroth size I'll put links to those in the video description so anybody can look at that. And they're in millimeters too, so you can work that out. But uh, they're very specific. I did get those from Flowhive and I'm posting them for you. So all the tolerances are in there so you can build your own custom box. Next one is from Lorraine Leitz. What books do you recommend for learning more about beekeeping? Forgot to bring the books down. Okay, so my favorite books. What books do you recommend for learning more about beekeeping? Start with the beginners right here. If anyone is starting beekeeping and they ask me what to get, this is the book I recommend to them. Stories Guide to Keeping Honeybees. This, these authors, Malcolm Sanford and Richard Bonney, they go through absolutely every step and all the different hive designs. They even talk about top bar hives and everything else. 
if you are just beginning with bees and it's winter time and you're going to take notes and you want to get things set up for your very first beekeeping experience and you want to know what to expect i recommend this book 244 pages softbound very nice i'll put links to all of these so that you don't have to write it down or remember them oh, i can't believe that's dusty that implies that i'm not a reader our native bees why would you be reading about this because the more you know about bees how they live in the wild and the more you know about uh, their genetics, their traits, 20,000 and plus bee species, and we talk specifically about the honeybees most of the time. But the truth is, the more you know about all bees, even ants and other social insects, you may begin to better understand what your own honeybees might need when you're keeping them. So Paige Embry, really good, our native bees, by the way. The photography in here is really fantastic, but the text is also really good. Here's another one by one of the most respected beekeepers I know, and that's Dr. Thomas Seeley. And this is called The Lives of Bees, The Untold Story of the Honeybee in the Wild. The more you know about the way bees live and survive in the wild, feral bees in the United States. He even talks about how to track bees, which I have tried to do in the past. It's a fantastic book, fantastic read, and this is where you get all the stats about dimensions of cavities that the bees occupy on their own, behavior that they demonstrate without the intervention of humans, which is very important because we are really just trying to imitate a tree cavity. And we have to do it in such a way when we set up our own beehives that uh, it can be inspected, that we can pull it apart, that it needs to be able to have removable frames so that you can get into every part and see if anything's going bad with your bees. Once you manage them, you're responsible for them. But the more we know about their natural history, the better prepared you are to keep them in an artificial environment like a bee yard, the backyard apiary. And of course, Hilary Kearney of Girl Next Door Honey she did this book called Queen Spotting. Now, this book is chock a block with pictures. So if you've got young people that are trying to learn about bees, this is a fantastic book. Uh, and it doesn't just have pictures of, you know, like, this is helpful, by the way. When you see pictures like this, and this is what you're going to encounter when you open up a beehive and you're looking at the brood frame and you're trying to find the queen, so this is a great game to play. What does a queen look like? Where would she be? Some of these are pretty challenging. You might think you're just going, oh yeah, I'll spot the queen right away. Well, they're not moving around. You don't get to see what the behavior is of the adjacent nurse bees with the queen. Like when the queen comes across the brood frame, she has a very specific behavior and the bees around her are very attentive. And sometimes that's a giveaway that helps you find the queen right away. But uh, these are great. The photography in this book is fantastic. The other thing that uh, Hillary shares about in this book is her uh, bee rescue. Her She's in San Diego, California, San Diego County, and she does a lot of swarm recovery and rescue, and she talks about those experiences. So this is actually a very good guide on keeping bees, aside from just the queen spotting. And she touches on something else that's kind of an eye roller for a lot of people. But I happen to agree with what she says here, that sometimes you tune in with your bees and that you can actually um, become very intuitive about what's going on with them. And she even kind of uses that skill set when she's trying to find the queen. She's collected swarms that have been queen less and then she's just had a hunch or an inkling that she needs to look in a specific area and wouldn't you know it, there's the queen. And had there not been other people around to witness the behavior like that uh, they would have just said oh that's that's who you can't feel your bees and kind of get an idea that you should check into something and then you find out that there was something you needed to look in on it happens to me all the time I'd just be sitting somewhere doing some work like wow i need to go and check the bee yard for some reason you go out there and sure enough there's a big swarm going on they're just starting to do it so i think you can tune in a lot of people are going to hate that Probably people will unsubscribe over the idea that you can tune in somehow to what's going on with your bees, but she covers that a lot in this fantastic book. Next, the bees in your backyard. 
Why should you even know about the wild species of bees? Well, because oftentimes neighbors and friends, when they find out you're a beekeeper, they'll say, oh, I have a honeybee in my backyard. I think it's yours. And then you get over there and you find out it's not a honeybee at all. Now, I think it's good to be prepared to talk to people about the different species of bees. Not only that, people look at hornets and wasps and they say, oh, I have a bunch of bees in my backyard and they're stinging everybody. Then you get over there and it's a bunch of yellow jackets. So they're not bees at all, they're wasps. The more educated you are, and this is a great time of year, we're going into winter, time to read, time to study up, time to build that erudition. So that when you do show up somewhere, you can be smart about it. And it's an opportunity to educate and a great way to learn. So you can even, like I used to do when I was a kid and I had my field guides, I would go through and mark off the, uh, the reptile species that I would find and things like that so that I would know when I located them and make my own notes about it. So learning about the bees in your backyard and the more you know, the more prepared you are to educate friends and neighbors and also the more you understand about how your own bees the bees that we're keeping are non-native these honeybees are not native to the united states at all they're all brought in so understanding more about their natural history and where they've come from will also inform you a little bit on how they might be interacting with your local native bees so those are the books bees in your backyard Again, I'll put all these links down in the video description for you. You don't have to write notes about it. They will be there. Great books. This is a great time of year to be learning. In fact, I wonder how come bee clubs don't have like a reading club for beekeeping. Because then when you read the books, you could uh, get together at your next breakfast and talk about what did you find helpful in the book? What didn't you like about the book? Would you recommend the book? And so it goes. So that's kind of cool. Read bee books, take notes. The more you know about their natural history, the better prepared you are to keep them. Here's uh, JP, the bee man in Delaware. By the way, Delaware, cool state. They bought 350 copies of my chicken video for their Department of Agriculture Poultry Licensing Technician Program. I like Delaware. Assuming my colonies survive winter, when would be a good time to split them next spring and add a bee weaver queen? Is there a preference with any of the bee weaver queens to get? They offer many. So here's the thing. Uh, when would be a good time to split them? First of all, spring is a good time because spring, here's what happens. Your bees tend to build up really fast. We've got them in smaller hive components because they've gotten through winter and we gave them less space to manage and protect. And uh, now we're in spring and they did this great buildup and now you've got all these bees bearding on the front and it looks like, oh no, they might swarm. So when your populations are building up, you have two choices. You either add more boxes, which may not stop the swarm, or you prepare for them to swarm and you can make a split. So when you start seeing queen cells that are, you know, two thirds done, they're all drawn out and it looks like they're going to They'll build those cells before they swarm. And those queens do not hatch before they swarm. So what you want to do is head off the swarm. That's really going to be a new colony anyway. So let's collect them out of there. And I also recommend, and this some people may not agree with, but when you do that split, there's nothing wrong with leaving those queen cells in there. Take the queen with your split. Most people say, do the split, pull brood frames and all of that, put those in the new box, make sure you leave the queen behind. I don't do that. If the queen stays behind, that's fine. If she goes with the split, that's fine. But we already know they're building queen cells. So if they're building queen cells in the resident colony and they're going to get rid of the queen, why not just facilitate that by removing the queen with the frames of brood that you take out to start your split? And then let those remaining queen cells hatch out, and then they will be the ones to replace themselves. And now we've still got a resident colony that wanted to swarm anyway. They were already trying to get rid of the queen. But then the question here is, JP wants to uh, know when to add a weaver queen. So if you're going to bring in a new queen, 
then you want to do that when you do your split because now we've got a queenless colony remember those queens haven't hatched yet so you can actually after three days of separation from their queen you can install the new queen into that colony and have them accept her and then if you want to you can cut up those um, queen cells that are in there but the differences are why on earth would you just buy a queen and not the packages anyway? Well, I'm about to explain that to you. First of all, you can't buy queen bees through the mail. I mean, you can't buy packages through the mail in every part of the country if you're getting them from the Weaver family. What's a package cost at Bee Weaver? If you're already in Texas and you want to go and get one, $230 to $225 for a three pound package. How much does a queen cost by herself? If you're just going to buy the queen, $51. That's survivor stock for row resistant hygienic queen genetics. That is a super awesome queen. So they'll fly her to you anywhere in the country. So if you're doing a split, you just saved yourself a lot of money by doing your own uh, and flying in the queen and installing her after they've been queenless for three days. Now, this is where the question comes in too. They offer three versions of their Weaver Survivor Queen. What are they? Well, you have the plain queen. That's a queen that's unmarked, and she has her full wing length and everything else, and that queen could actually swarm anytime she wants. She could fly. The second one is a marked queen, where they do a paint daub on the thorax. Right behind the head of the queen, they'll do a bright color, and that's by year. So each year that the queens are produced, they have a specifically assigned color for that thorax. So you'll know if you have a queen in your colony that's a couple years old. The next part is marked and clipped. And by marked and clipped, it means they put that assigned dot, which has to do with the year that she's hatched, and they're going to clip one of her wings. That's so that that queen, if she decides to leave the colony, can't go far. She's going to go right out on the ground, or she's going to fly to a tree two feet away, and your whole swarm of bees in theory, will be right there and you can collect them and hive them and harvest that uh, swarm. So that's a way that you can start to expand your apiary and then the queen that's left behind, of course, that hatches out there is going to be of the weaver line, but she's also gonna open breed now and now her genetics are gonna mix with whatever's going on in the vicinity of your backyard apiary. So those are the differences. Plain queen, completely intact, fertile, ready to lay eggs, no marking, no clipped wings. She's totally capable of flying and probably will eventually. The marked one, you'll know if your queen gets replaced, but it's also been my experience that sometimes the queen rubs off that thorax uh, paint dab and even sometimes the other bees groom off the paint dab until you don't see but little remnants of it. So sometimes when you think your queen has been replaced, she may actually not have been. She might have just rubbed away the paint. But if she's got a clipped wing and a paint dab, there's no question as to whether or not that's the same queen because even if the paint dab goes away, you've got the clipped wing and you know that's my queen. So, you save a lot of money. By the way, today at the Weaver family, at their apiary, they're giving hive tours, they're having honey tasting, and then they also have a mead bar. So if you're in that part of Texas, down southeast Texas, and you want to get over there and visit that apiary, by the time you're probably seeing this, I'm sure they're closed because they're not going to do it tomorrow. This is the last day. But that's what they're doing today. If I get some kind of super fast internet upload, you're going to get that, and you're going to get those, uh, that information, and you can hang out with the Weaver family. Can't pick up your bees yet though. Let's talk about when can you get them. If you're ordering bees from the Weaver family, if you're gonna order queens or whatever, you're anticipating that you're gonna either artificially split your colonies or that they're gonna be swarming and you know you're gonna need a queen, you can order now and get them anywhere. Delivery is from April 20th is the earliest and June 29th is the latest. I'm in the Northeastern United States in the state of Pennsylvania. My favorite time to install new queens is in May, the second week of May. What else do we have? That's it. That's all I have for you today. I apologize for those of you who were surprised when they looked at my channel and saw that there was a wedding slideshow instead of information about bees. 
that bride said she would like it if I went ahead and made that public. She's sharing it with all of her friends, and this is my channel, so that's what I did. Uh, if the title doesn't say something about bees, don't watch it, if, if it's going to be annoying. If you have questions, post your questions down in the comments section. I uh, hope you like the video. I am going to still try to do live chats in the coming week, especially when we get the snow and everything, get some of my photography caught up, and then I can... Uh, come down and do live chats with everyone. Someone else said, is there any chance that you would consider scheduling those? The problem with scheduling a chat is, I don't know if my internet's even gonna be fast enough. It seems to kind of come in waves, you know, where it speeds up and slows down different times of the day and even different days of the week. The other thing is I do those chats when um, I just have free time. So if all of a sudden I get a cancellation or a reschedule or something and I have that extra hour or 30 minutes, I will pop down and do a live beekeeping chat with people. So it's difficult to schedule, at least for now. Later, I might be able to do something like that. The quality is not good, uh, but the quality for these presentations is above average. So I hope you have a fantastic weekend. I hope everything's going great with your bees. Post your questions and comments down below. Thank you for joining me today. Have a great weekend.